Hello again, everyone. It's me. It's uh, me. Um, it feels a little bit weird introducing who I am every single time I start up a new video. But I mean, who knows at what starting point somebody's coming on. So, hi. I'm C.K. Birch. I'm an author, a uh, blogger, Twitterer. I don't tweet so much as I spew. And um, I'm a general. I am a huge geek. So this is my geek review. And um, considering that we started off with Star Trek The Motion Picture, then visited its mirror universe twin, Star Trek V, Final Frontier, I thought that we might as well continue with the Star Trek franchise and go through the remainder of the original series films. So for me, looking at Star Trek two, three, and 4, it's really hard to... Um, judge any of them on an individual basis. Well, maybe maybe Star Trek 2, because that one, it, that's the way it began. That's how it started off with. You know, you've got this really unique series of films. It is a trilogy within a franchise. Now, to an extent, Star Trek 5 and Star Trek 6 continued on after where Star Trek 4 left off. I mean, they kind of had to, but it didn't necessarily literally continue story-wise. You've got three acts. You've got, you know, it really it really is a three-act structure. You've got a total trilogy within the series. And it's so unique and it's and it's not anything I've seen done in any other franchise, series, or saga, what have you. And the Star Wars saga doesn't count because you've got two sets of trilogies. You don't have one and then a trilogy and then two other films that come after that. This is literally its own beast within the series itself. So, like I said, it's hard for me to look at any one of these and go, well, I like this film because I can sit down and watch any of them because I know the story. But if we're really going to truly review them in a geek-out manner, we've got to take all three films, look at them all side by side. So, to start off with, we're going to go with Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Um, coming off of the motion picture, which some refer to as the slow motion picture, and for very good reason, um, Paramount wasn't exactly happy with the direction that Star Trek was taking, so they hired on some fresh blood to kind of give it a new spin, spit, polish the whole nine yards, and what we get, for better or for worse, is the more nautical maritime-themed Star Trek universe that Nicholas Meyer concocted in creating Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Everything's different. Um, the Enterprise is a little bit more detailed, especially interior-wise. Um, the uniforms have way more of a naval feel to them. Um, the Starfleet in general has way more of a naval feel to it. And the film makes plenty of references to Moby Dick. And um, especially in the battles between Kirk and Khan, the Enterprise and the Reliant fighting each other, it's highly reminiscent of old naval battles. So, the whole nautical theme, this is where it really swept into the Star Trek universe. We got, you kind of got that trailblazing, um, high adventure, wagon train to the stars that the original series had been continuing for some time, and that the motion picture, to an extent, tried to capture, but the motion picture was more of like a broad, grand sci-fi film of the 70s versus an adventure film in space, which is what Star Trek originally was. So, now we've got this new nautical theme, and it totally works. Like, for the series, it, it absolutely works. Now, I say this theme is introduced for better or for worse, because it seemed to lend itself as more of a trapping in later films, like the Next Generation films, taking on that nautical sort of sense and less of the high grand adventure that is what made Star Trek so great. Exploration and adventure. I mean, the Next Generation series captured that very well, um, but for some reason slipped into this kind of brooding, high seas, like, diplomatic political pursuit. And it just really felt, once we got into the Next Generation, it felt slow and unwieldy, like some, like it was there, but you could tell that it was there only because it just was there. It wasn't 
exactly working for a part of the series. But, when it was first introduced in Star Trek 2, it totally worked. It was an absolute revamp. It was exactly what the series and the franchise needed at that time. And it totally works. And there's really little to be said about Wrath of Khan that hasn't been said before. You've got a great villain in Khan. Not only do they do an excellent job of recounting what happened to Khan before, but um, Ricardo Montalban's performance of the character, having played the same character in the television show, bringing him back automatically lends both a sense of credibility and the legitimacy that the series desperately needed. So you've got this villain who is just boiling for Kurt's blood. And I have to say that even though the continuity of bringing Khan back was very solid, the thing that pissed me off and still pisses me off is that if you go back and you watch the original episode, Chekhov is nowhere to be found because Chekhov didn't join the ship until the second season. Um, I, I don't remember exactly where they explained this. Someone, they did some kind of, like, retcon where they're like, oh, yeah, Chekhov was over here. He was an ensign or something, but he knew Khan. And it, that's bullshit. It just pissed me off that Chekhov immediately knew who Khan was. Like, they couldn't have just used someone else. They used a different character. Because Chekhov just wouldn't have known. And they might have retconned it later, but at the time it was like, no, he wasn't in that episode. He wouldn't have known. That's always pissed me off. It kind of pisses me off when continuity isn't followed. And continuity is, especially in something like Star Trek, is not that difficult. You'd only had three seasons of the show up until this point. You could have just gone back and watched the original episode and gone, well, there's no check off. Used a different character. Sulu, in that place, would have made perfect sense because Sulu was there. But I digress. Um, the story is tense. It, it brings in such classic things like the Kobayashi Maru test. It introduces Genesis Planet, Kirk's son. It introduces, um, you know, the idea that the characters have aged. Kirk is feeling the onset of age. Um, there's so much going on. And, it, and it's thrown at you piecemeal. It's like, it's not overwhelming you. The story is very well paced. It's very well written with a lot of the undertones and the dialogue. It, it's just, it's again, it's hard to say something about the Wrath of Khan that hasn't already been said before. It is a great film. Um, there are minor quibbles I have with it, but it's minor because, you know, for the most part it feels like everything just kind of happens. Everything just kind of falls into place a little too neatly. And, you know, they, they don't really have to, like, work too hard to progress the story. You know, Khan is here, Khan is there, they are here, they are there. They just kind of go from one point to the next, and the next thing you know, you know. But, but I mean, it's so well done, it's hard to really call that a complaint against the film. But, as, uh, as we all know... The ending of the film results in the explosion of the Genesis device, creating the Genesis planet within the Mutara Nebula, and um, Spock subjects himself to intense radiation in order to repair the warp engines so that the Enterprise can get away in time, thus resulting in Spock's death, thus resulting in um, a, a, a beautiful funeral scene where like, some of Shatner's best performance is right here in this one scene where he almost breaks down crying over his friend, calling him that his soul was the most human. Man, and, and then they, they, they shoot Spock's body down on the Genesis planet as, um, as a bit of a burial. So then, it the ends and we go on. People were pissed that Spock had died, so of course, they knew that they needed to bring Spock back. Well, Leonard Nimoy had wanted to get out, but after seeing the film, and after having a good time on the film, and after seeing fan reaction, <coughs> pardon me, I'm still recovering from a bit of a cold. After seeing fan reaction and everything, and having a good time, Leonard Nimoy had to go to Michael Eisner and convince him, yes, I want to do another film, and I would like to direct it. So they got the green light literally the day after Wrath of Khan opened to do another film. That film ended up being Star Trek III, Search for Spock. This film gets some mixed reviews from fans and from film critics. Now, there are some decent quibbles 
as far as quality of the film. Um, they do something that I have not seen in too many sequels, in that what they do is they open up the film with footage from the previous film. So, um, you know, you've got that, you've got that, that instant connection to what has come before, because it's been two years since you saw the last film. And this was back in the day where it wasn't like, they were just pumping out DVDs and VHS, and you sat down and you watched it and you watched it and you watched it. It was like, no, it's been a legitimate amount of time since the last film came out. Home media um, wasn't that burgeoning a market at the time. So, Star Trek Three, you know, opens up with footage from the previous film. Um, we get ourselves squarely placed back into Spock is dead. Spock has been shot down on the Genesis planet. And then now we've got the Enterprise uh, slowly limping home back to Space Star. Um, there's a very interesting way how they do that. Um, it starts off with the captain, um, with Kirk delivering his captain's log, kind of recapping everything that's just come about, giving us um, his thoughts, um, insight into his mind as to where every, as to how he's feeling, how everyone is doing on the ship, and then. Um, in what I felt was probably one of the things against against such a spot is that it doesn't really leave any mystery as to how Spock is going to come back. I mean, right away, Dr. McCoy is found in Spock's quarters. He's talking like he's Spock. He's acting like he's Spock. He's talking about going back home to Vulcan. Kirk thinks it's stress. But we, the audience, we know better. It's not subtle. And I wish they had played that a little more subtle, because it's just kind of hits you over the head, obvious. Now, perhaps this is to distract from the secrets of what happens later on in the film, but it's not very subtle, and as a result, not very well written. I mean, it's well written enough. But if you're trying to keep the audience in, in a bit of a suspension of disbelief that Kirk doesn't really get what's going on, you got to write it a little bit better than this. It has to be a little bit more subtle. But it's acted well, and for the most part, it works. It's just not, it's just, I hate, it's, you're like kind of, it, yeah, you know what? Yeah. So that said, we get um, we get introduced to Commander Cruz, played by Christopher Lloyd, um, and this movie coming out a full year before Back to the Future. It's very interesting to see Christopher Lloyd as a uh, as a Klingon, and his performance is great. He's he's very snarkily charming, and I really liked him. A lot of people don't call him a great villain, and on paper, no, he's not a great villain. But Cru but uh, uh, Christopher Lloyd does not ham him up or over exaggerate the character. He simply plays him as straight as possible, as this like shifty-minded, conniving, strategic guy who's trying to get what he wants, and it totally works. I really, I really like Christopher Lloyd in this role, and um, actually, he adds a lot of much-needed um, color and spice to the film's characters, and he makes the film very watchable just on his own. Even if you take out some of the other stuff in the film. Um, Christopher Lloyd makes his film watchable just for his performance. But um, Cruz um, gets information on the Genesis planet. He steals it because he wants that destructive power for himself and for the Klingon Empire. Clearly not acting on Klingon rules. I mean, you know, he's a bit of a renegade, but a renegade with a cause, if you will. So, after we meet Cruz, Kirk is visited by Sarek, Spock's father, who accuses him of abandoning Spock. Kirk has no idea what's going on. And then Sarek is uh, forced to mind meld with Kirk. He discovers that Spock had not, had, didn't do anything to Kirk to make Kirk want to go and restore Spock's body. So he has to explain. He's like, well, there's this thing. It's, uh, it's when Vulcans, they will mind meld before they know they're going to die. And they put their katra, their soul, which I didn't really like the usage of that word. I liked more, if you would, if they'd used the word being or essence, it would have felt a little bit less mystical, but I digress. Um, but like placing, basically, Spock placing himself inside another human being, or another person's mind, in order that 
um, they could revive his body later and put his soul back into his body. Kirk kind of gets it, but, you know, we the audience, having seen the scene with Dr. McCoy earlier, we already know what's going on. But Kirk has to literally go and watch a security tape to see Spock mind meld with McCoy, and then he gets it. So, it's, it, anyway, it's interesting to see Kirk's investigative process, but again, we know, we get it, we the audience are not held in any sort of suspension of disbelief, it, it's not a revelation at all, it's no surprise, so it kind of ruins the effect. Anyways, Kirk goes to Starfleet to say, let me go back to Genesis so that I can get Spock's body. And he explains to them what's going on, but they're like, no, no one's going to Genesis. No one's allowed to talk about Genesis. We're not going to do anything along those lines, you know. And Starfleet kind of comes off as a dick, because they've decommissioned the Enterprise. They put Scotty on the Excelsior. No one's talking about Genesis. No one's allowed to go to Genesis, except for the scientific team that is already there, which is comprised of the crew of the USS Grissom and by uh, David Marcus. Kirk's son, who we got introduced to in the second film, and Savick, who is uh, Spock's cousin, in a way. I think she's his cousin. She's half Romulan. She was originally played by Christy Alley, now played by Robin Curtis. Mm, I really wish Christy Alley had come back, because honestly, Robin Curtis's performance leaves something to be desired. That's kind of one of the things going against the film, is Savick just wasn't really well acted. Like, I I didn't really... Savick and Wrath of Khan, I felt fairly connected to. Savick in Star Trek Three, I think that particular performance by that actress just kind of um, lessened it. Now, Christy Alley did not want to come back for fear of being typecast, so hey, what were they going to do? Um, but, meh. Yeah, well. And then David, Kirk's son, I felt was not given enough screen time or emotional connection to for the audience, as a character, so that later on, when he dies, we don't really care. I didn't care so much. Like, Kirk's perform uh, Kirk, William Shatner's performance in that moment made me care, but I did not care that the character who had died was dead. Like, there was not enough um, emotional connection from an audience perspective to David, and that is another one of the film's shortcomings. Um, but, David and Savick, they go down to the surface, they chase down a life form, again, after finding the empty torpedo tube that had Spock's body in it. This movie is written where the characters are just kind of dumb in order to progress the plot. They're intelligent in some ways, but they're dumb in other ways, but it's done so in order to progress the plot. That sucks, because we, the audience, are sitting here going, Guys. Guys. It's, it's, it's frustrating. Um, but, ultimately, Kirk steals the Enterprise, which is a great sequence. Um, he faces off against the Klingon Bird of Prey, which is another great sequence. I love how you can, they could kind of see the Klingon bird of prey, cloaked and moving about. And they're kind of like, there, there, look, da, da, da. And they discover, they decipher that it's cloaked. They're able to, like, kind of target it before it decloaks and take it out and disable it. And it's like, you really get this great sense of Kirk's strategic command knowledge. Um, and that of the Klingons as well, because they're forced into a stalemate because they shoot each other to the point where they can't really fight anymore. But since Kirk doesn't, since the Enterprise has been disabled, Kirk tricks the Klingons into coming over, and he blows up the Enterprise. That might be why the whole Spock thing might have not been as written as subtle as it was, to kind of distract from the fact that Kirk ends up blowing up the Enterprise. Which is a pretty powerful and emotional moment. I mean, it's it's tough to watch. I mean, this is the Enterprise. This is It's, it's, it's being blown up intentionally. But it's, in, it's a really well-done scene. It's really tense. It's really emotional, it's really powerful and epic feeling, and it's exactly appropriate for what it should be. But again, I grieve that I felt more emotional connection to a starship, and cared more that the starship, an inanimate object, however iconic it might be, 
I cared more that the Enterprise blew up than I cared about David Marcus's death. That shows the lack of emotional connection to David Marcus. We really only know and or care about him based upon what we saw of him in Star Trek II. And we don't see that much of him in this film doing anything other than spouting techno babble and looking for Spock. Anyways, Kirk has a fist fight with the with Cruz down on the planet. Uh, everybody beams up. They get away. They restore Spock's brain to his mind or to his body. And we have the end of the movie. And we get the sense that Spock is not really all there, but he's getting there, and he's going to be himself again. He's kind of retraining his mind. Um, and Search for Spock... <coughs> excuse me. Search for Spock is a decent enough film. Um, Leonard Nimoy directed it, and I really got the sensation that he was getting his sea legs. I got the sensation from Search of Spock that had The Final Frontier, directed by Shatner, had that film had a slightly better script and better special effects, it would have been on par with Search for Spock. Because, quite frankly, both men directing in that capacity did a pretty decent and equal job. Um, but as it stands, the film is a little clunky in places, a little clumsy, and the script itself is not very well written. Special effects are great, the action, when it gets going, is great, the tension is really great, but... a Aside from that, the film is slightly clunky, and everything just kind of goes. It just, it's well-paced, but it just goes. So, that's the search for Spock. And then we move into the Star Trek film that isn't really a Star Trek film, but is a Star Trek film, and that's Star Trek IV, Voyage Home. Now, in rewatching these, I've grown a brand new appreciation for the, the score, the soundtracks of these movies. I really hate the Star Trek march that Jerry Goldsmith came up with. So, James Horner's film scores in Wrath of Khan and in Search for Spock were like a breath of fresh air. So amazing. And I mean, Search for Spock is the superior soundtrack. Call it blasphemy. But, Stealing the Enterprise and the themes of Spock and Genesis, the uh, Klingon theme that incorporated some of Jerry Goldsmith's music, and the sweeping Star Trekness of it, it is a superior score. Now, I'm not calling Wrath of Khan's soundtrack bad by any stretch. It's a classic. But The Search for Spock has the superior score. I say that because we get a brand new composer for Star Trek IV, Leonard Rosenman. And he brings a very upbeat, peppy, kicky sort of, like, 80s comedy sort of score. Now, it is appropriately Star Trek where it needs to be, but I felt like it was almost too light-hearted. And I, I got used to it, but when the opening credits come up, I really felt disoriented and kicked out for a moment. And thank God it was just the opening credits, because otherwise I would have been like, mm hmm? Now again, he, it is appropriately Star Trek and tense in places, but for the most part, the light-heartedness and the oddly... What's word? I mean, it's hard to describe it. It feels like it could have been a soundtrack to another movie. Actually, a lot of this film felt like it could have been another movie. Like, it felt like it took the word Star Trek away. And had this been, like, an 80s comedy sci-fi vehicle, that's what it would be. But, that aside, Star Trek IV... We open up with the discovery of this probe heading towards Earth. It is emitting this distress signal, communication, not sure what, but it's so powerful that it's knocking the power out of passing by starships and the, you know, Earth Starduck, and it's heading for Earth. And when it gets for Earth, it begins vaporizing the oceans and creating cloud cover, blocking out the sun, and turning off all the power on Earth. So, shit's got really real. The stakes are actually really high in this film from one very simple alien device that has no real purpose aside from sending out a communication that is causing damage wherever it goes. 
Um, so Kirk and the rest of the Enterprise crew are on Vulcan, and they're getting ready to head back to face trial for their crimes, and Spock is reorienting himself to being half human, half Vulcan, instead of being, you know, just like 100% Vulcan now that he's been on the planet for quite some time. And on their way back, they get the distress call from Starfleet, which sets up perfectly the rest of the film, in that they discover, Spock discovers, that it's a cry of a humpback whale. That is what the probe is essentially sending out. It's aiming it towards the oceans, so it sounds like a humpback whale song underwater. Um, so they figure out, we need to go backwards in time, we need to get humpback whales, and we need to bring them into the future. Now that might sound really weird as a setup, but as far as Star Trek plots go, that's pretty fucking cool. Now it's a traditional kind of a concept. What do we need to do? We need to bring something back from the past in order to make the future livable again. Really neat. And yeah, they do only go slightly overboard on the whole eco-friendly green type of uh, message. But um, they go back in time to 1986, and the film is really lively. It picks up a lot of speed. Um, it's really well paced, really well written, and it gives every character, from Scotty to Sulu, an appropriate amount of screen time and the uh, the chance to do something that that is totally worthwhile and honorable to their character. So like, um, it, I mean, gosh, everybody gets screen time, and they all get some great scenes together. And the way that everything falls into place is very organic. Like I said, it's very lively. The comedy of the fish out of water situation is great. Kirk and Spock have. There's wonderful discussions that Spock is trying to re-kind of connect with human beings, and it all feels very natural. It all feels, oh, just so well written. Nothing is forced in this film. It is, it is spaced out well. Um, the tension is real. Like, they have a time crunch, and they just happen to be at the right spot at the right time, but there is this threat of their luck kind of running out, and them not being able to complete their mission the way that they need to complete their mission. <coughs> Especially once Chekhov um, is caught by the local military and they have to go get him. I could rave about this film. I could rave about this film for how well written and intense and just well designed the film is. Special effects are great. Leonard Nimoy really comes into his own as a director here. You can sense the confidence behind the camera. You can sense his command over the camera, over the script, over the actors. It feels very lighthearted and jubilant. Now, that's again, that's probably why his score sounds the way it does, but the score sounds a little too Alan Silvestri for me. And Alan Silvestri can pull out some scores that are just a little syrupy, a little cornstarchy, if you will. Um, but ultimately, they find these two whales. They go through all kinds of hoops in order to convert their Klingon bird of prey, one, into a whale tank, and two, to get enough power to be able to get back home, and three, to get the whales. Now, they end up bringing along uh, Dr. Jillian Taylor, who was taking care of the whales previously, played by Katherine Hicks, who ends up going to be in the TV show Seventh Heaven, along with um, the guy who played Commodore Captain Decker in Star Trek The Motion Picture. So now you got two Star Trek albums who were both in the uh, same religious television series. Go figure. Anyways, to make a long story short, because this film, out of all the films, can be the most easily summarized. Um, they go back in time. They go through some pitfalls. They get the whales. They return to the present. And everything's great. But it's not about the summary. It's about the journey. And the journey is so... Every problem they come up against feels natural. Every obstacle that they must surmount that feels very natural. Every Everything that happens in the script feels so natural and tense. And it feels like they're always pressed and moving against um, destiny, fate, what have you. It's like they're always working to solve a problem and come up with a new solution in order to get to where they need to go. And I like that about this film a lot. 
because they keep coming up with ways, they keep coming up against problems, and then keep coming up with solutions, and then keep coming up against problems right up until the very end. Now, what's admirable about the film, and what's admirable about the story, is that they go back to Starfleet. You know, at the very end, they're back at Starfleet, facing trial for the crimes that they committed. You know, disobeying authority, stealing a, uh, stealing the Enterprise, and, um, just generally being, you know, nuisances to Starfleet in general. But in light of them saving the planet, all charges are dropped except for one, which is disobeying authority. And then that is leveled squarely at Kirk, who accepts it, and he's demoted um, permanently to the rank of captain instead of admiral. And then what do they get as their grand reward? They are assigned to a new starship. Sulu hopes for the Excelsior, and he'll eventually get it just not in this film, and Kirk figures a ship is a ship, but they're quite surprised, happily so, by the sight of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701A at the very end of the film, which they're able to take off and put into warp speed. And then we get this cute little credits that shows us scenes from where the film had been before, and uh, cutesy... Sci-fi film score. Oh god, I just didn't like the score. I mean, it's good. It's appropriately Star Trek for me. Yeah. Anyways, it's 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 a great film. It's it's one that I've seen more than like I saw this one a lot growing up, and it still holds up very well. In fact, I was very surprised at how well it held up. I was very surprised at the quality of the writing and of uh, the direction and of the filmmaking in general. Um. Uh. But for me, still, the lack of general sci-fi-ness of uh, starships and space and phasers and escapades, it kind of lowers it in my book only slightly. Now, especially after going back and seeing it again, um, after re-watching it and being very surprised at how much of a quality film it is, it's gone up in my book slightly. So um, if we have to give a score to each of these films in the trilogy, I would give Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, a 9 out of 10. Search for Spock would get an 8 out of 10. And The Voyage Home would get an 8.5 out of 10. Or just slightly because of those few little quibbles I had. But if you average it out, the whole trilogy, taken as one long story in three acts, gets an 8.5 out of 10. And rightfully so. It's a great story from beginning to end, even if it sags slightly in the middle, as sequels, act, second acts are, are want to do, mostly. And Search for Spock definitely um, holds up to the sequel is the darker film of the trilogy aspect. But overall, as a trilogy and as individual films, I really liked it um, a lot. So, in going through the Star Trek rewatch, being surprised by the quality of The Voyage Home, I wonder what it will be like rewatching Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, which I have long held in my nostalgic memory as the best of the original Star Trek series films. Will it still hold up? We'll find out. I'm going to go watch that, and then I'll be reporting back next week with my review of Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, and then we'll get the Star Trek films out of the way, and then we'll move on to some other sci-fi. I have a couple of other reviews I wanted to do. In fact, there was one I was going to do before this, but I was unhappy with how it came out, and I had another idea of how to redo it, so I'm going to, yeah, that's why we got this. Anyways, um, if you check the description, you can find links to where I am around the web, my blog, Twitter. You can see some of the books that I've uh, written that are up on Amazon, if you go check it out. And um, thanks for sitting down with me for the last half hour or so. Um, this has been my Geek Review, and I hope to see you next week.